It's the Wilk Report. I'm Michael Wilk coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio with an outrageous bit of news to report. Because Outrageous because uh, in the wake of Julian Assange's arrest on trumped-up charges uh, by the Trump regime and uh, British authorities over his actual journalism and uh, corporate reporters blasting him, saying he's not a journalist, even though he does more journalists than they ever have or will. Um, and this is relevant, this little political diatribe here, because CBS has, once again, taken out a paid article in the New York Times. All right, and the, the reason uh, all this... Uh, must be distinguished uh, because if you see in the title on the on the title card here uh new york times stenographer lies in showpiece for a paid for review by cbs uh all right so new york times std season two episode 13 saying goodbye maybe by uh sopan deb uh basically uh, the the last time uh, a piece like this appeared in the New York Times. Let's see if I can call it up. Uh, they had a, an actual disclaimer saying that it had been paid for by CBS. So let's see if we can find... Yeah, you can see all these. These are all uh, paid for articles, basically. Uh, they, they are clearly written by uh, shills for CBS. And if I can call up the page here. Let's see. No, that's not cooperating, but let's see. All right. All right, so, but yeah, these are, uh, yeah, I'm trying to find the original article uh, that I read that said it was a uh, paid-for article. Let's see, we've got, all right. Yeah, so Pondeb appears to have written every single one of these. So, uh, okay, it's not showing up. They might have scrubbed it, but, or maybe I'm just not uh, finding the right uh, article here, but. You you can see here though. I mean, it they're they're pretty much giving a, a an oratory blowjob to STD. Uh, yeah, notice how they've got Star Trek Discovery in quotation marks. Like, well, first of all, uh, I don't know if I would do that in a news article. Maybe put it in italics, but it's not even Star Trek. But uh, you know, the, 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 the lies in here are many and numerous. I'm, I'm going to try and break it down. For, first of all, it's not a Star Trek show. It's simply a generic sci fantasy show that has a Star Trek label slapped onto it. That's the first lie by calling it a Star Trek show. Second, there are gratuitous shots of the Enterprise. Well, no, they're not. There are not gratuitous shots of the Enterprise. There's... There are gratuitous shots of a ship that is called the Enterprise, but it is not the Enterprise. On screen, we've seen uh, iterations of the actual Enterprise from the original series, Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, the the movies up to uh, uh, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, uh, where we have the motion picture era enterprise we've got 
the Enterprise from first contact all the way from that to Nemesis, and that's pretty much it. You know, so uh, yeah, that this is not the Enterprise. It's just a ship that is called the Enterprise. It doesn't even look like the Enterprise. We spend much of the episode on what will eventually become Kirk's ship, or will it? Wait a minute, what do you mean, or will it? You're saying it might not? Well, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, which is just a, a complete and flat-out lie, because it, it it's a writing hole that they've written themselves into. I mean, first of all, it has to become Kirk's ship, because that's been established. If this show is supposed to take place 10 years before the original series, and already this season you've used footage from the cage to imply that at some point it would all morph into original Trek, which it won't. So yeah, right there is a lie by, by implying that it might not become Kirk's ship. Well, it has to, because it has to stick within what you're calling canon. But of course we all know it's not canon. We see the colorful uniforms we grew to love in the original series. Well, no, you don't, because they are not the original uniforms. In contrast to the dark blue typical of the Discovery crew. Well, yeah, and if you look at it, the and I actually had to alter the, the photo here. It's not nearly as colorful as this. It's all, I mean, here, I'll, I'll even scroll up and show you the unaltered photo. It's all blues and muted grays and blue color tones here uh, in place of good lighting. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're not seeing this. Uh, we hear the whooshes of the sliding doors on the whistle when Pike walks on the bridge. Well, okay, just because you have the, the sound effects from the original show doesn't mean that it is Star Trek. Uh, she looks as good as I remember. Pike says, better in fact, thanks to decades worth of production upgrades. Well, that's just your opinion. That's not a fact. The Trek franchise has been in dire need of a fresher look. No, it hasn't. I wish I was into it, and not just because of how it looked. Previous Trek shows with tie-ins to earlier iterations sometimes struggled to keep this story their own. See the Voyager episode Death Wish involving Q. Wait, wait, wait a minute. What, what, what do you mean struggled to keep the story their own? I mean, and then go, and then the the writer goes ahead and says unification in the next generation. Keep the tone the show has already established while also properly integrating external elements from its forebears. Uh, okay, first of all, you actually did that with the Voyager episode Death Wish, because in Death Wish, a member of the Q Continuum is accidentally freed from uh, an asteroid by Voyager, and he was in prison there because he wants to actually die, which is significant because the Q are immortal, and for one of them to choose to become mortal and die, it's, yeah, it's a pretty big deal. But uh, how exactly did that episode struggle to keep the story its own? Y you're making no sense. Uh, I, I, the, the, the lies here. I, I mean, it's pretty clear that this imbecile has never seen an episode of actual Star Trek. Ever. Hasn't seen Voyager, hasn't seen The Next Generation, hasn't seen Deep Space Nine, probably. All right, such sweet sorrow has Burnham making, uh, preparing to make a giant sacrifice. No, because if there's a season three and she's the star and sole focus, she's going to be in it, so she's not making any sacrifice. The sphere and the discovery have merged, making it impossible to destroy while Leland and Control are speeding to come get the data. As Spock says, Discovery's very existence is a problem. Well, <laughs> that's probably the one true thing this article has actually said so far. Because, yes, STD is the problem. The, that the show even exists is the problem. Burnham proposes using the crystal to take the data out of this time, meaning Discovery has to go to the future. But of course, Burnham is the one who must go to the future without a certain path back to the present. Spock deduces that there is more than one Red Angel, one of them being Burnham. Which, obviously, I mean, we, we were pretty much pointing that out from the beginning. 
beginning of the season when it started broadcasting on CBS No Access because, you know, it was telegraphed. The Red Angel was actually made up to look like Michael Burnham in a mecha suit with wings. And it was already established in one of the episodes that uh, the Red Angel's uh, brain patterns match Burnham's to a T. Not her mother, because her mother is a completely different person. So I don't know where the fuck you're getting this shit that, uh, you know, the Red Angel always was just one person, Burnham's mother. No, there's... Uh, oh, yeah, fuck, freaking telegraphed. I mean, and, and you say that this is a well-written show? No, it's not. You, you, you fucking moron. A new signal appears that leads the discovery to Zaheya, the to the, the delight of Tilly. Zaheya, you might remember, was the focus of one of the short bus track episodes from before the official second season of STD. The queen of Zaheya, Poe, is a 17-year-old who developed technology to recrystallize dilithium, which comes in handy in creating the supernova necessary to launch Burnham and the Discovery into the future. Ah, so, so now we're getting the slingshot effect being dragged back out because time crystals aren't enough now. Now you need to go back and use the slingshot effect because you don't know how to fucking do time travel or even properly use elements from the original series in a prequel to the original series. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, moving on. Burnham's crewmates in a show of loyalty commit to going with her into the future, suggesting that we might never see the Discovery crew again unless the rest of the show takes place in the future. Curiously, Pike offers to wear the suit in the first part of the episode, but doesn't offer to go later on. I was also surpri surprised that Grayson and Sarek didn't offer to go as well. well. Why are you surprised? I mean, it's already established that they don't go into the future because they're seen in the original series. So how can they go on a one-way trip to the future? And here's a, you know, another thing which even the writer has to acknowledge. The problem here is a self-created one by the Discovery writing team. Much of the episode features emotional goodbyes, but as, we, as we've seen, characters too often appear to get killed off only to return. And in this case, Spock is one of the crew who says he'll go with Burnham to the future, and we know that this actually doesn't happen unless we are just wholly disregarding Trek canon. Well, STD... In general, just completely and wholly disregards Trek canon. You're just now figuring that out? This show is not canon. It disregards it, uh, original Star Trek canon, and it even disregards what it has established itself. I mean, we're talking lazy and inconsistent writing that can't even be bothered to pay attention to what it's setting up. Ugh. I mean, and this imbecile writing the column is just... Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, all right. So my prediction is that Burnham doesn't even get to make the trip because Control finds a way to disrupt the time crystal in the finale. Well, no, because again, we're the 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 show has already telegraphed that Burnham is a red angel. So we're we're not getting any surprises here. Okay, they they used up their magic mystery box for the season, and that's it. Burnham is a red angel. And if you're saying that, if you're trying to predict, that, it just shows that you're not even paying attention to this show because it is so telegraphed that uh, there's no way that they that they can't send Burnham into the future to become the Red Angel because they've already set up and dropped hints that she is. In terms of control as original Borg theory, I'm beginning to come around. I've said before that I don't think this is a good idea for Star Trek as a whole. But let's see if that actually happens in the season finale. Vulture's Devon Maloney wrote a really stupid piece, actually. It's not smart. It's uh, She calls it a really smart piece. It's actually a really stupid piece. And, and I, I will actually open up this article because it shows that this imbecile has obviously never seen a single solitary episode of Star Trek because uh, it was already established in Q-Who when... Uh, you know, the season two episode where we first see the Borg. Guinan says that they've been evolving for thousands of centuries. So at least 200,000 years. And in the Star Trek Voyager episode Scorpion, the Vadwar mentions that the Borg in his time, which was set 
which is like 900 years before the episode was set. Uh, so it would be the Middle Ages for us. Uh, that they were still limited to a very small part of the Delta Quadrant. So they already existed 900 years prior to uh, Star Trek Voyager, which means they existed at least 800 years prior to STD. So there is no fucking way, unless you completely disregard canon, because STD is not canon, and just makes shit up as it goes along and, and throws stuff in it as pointless fan service because uh, the writers think they're being clever and they're not. But it's not brilliant and you're completely rewriting Star Trek canon. Well, just to satisfy your own lazy writing because you can't be bothered to pay attention to what's already been set up. It's like the, 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 these imbeciles writing... All these shill articles have not even seen a single solitary episode of Star Trek. They can't have, because they, they, they display with every shill piece that they write that they, they, they have no knowledge of Trek. They've never even seen it. I mean, if you actually watched these episodes, you would know that all, all of the things that have been established contradict everything that STD is doing. Which is why making it a prequel was always so fucking stupid, because you cannot have something that disregards its own canon with each and every single episode and then expect people to believe it and believe it's canon and uh, believe it's even trying to be consistent. So, yeah, I, I mean... Th Shit like this just pisses me off because, you know, CBS is so desperate to get people to go behind its paywall to watch shows that, I mean, there's really only one show on there, like one new show that is even remotely worth watching. And even that uh, started off with two mediocre episodes and a third that is actually decent, which I, uh, you know, mentioned in my previous video, but you know, it, it's okay. It's not great. You know, I mean, it does do a good job, I think, of re returning the Twilight Zone to its uh, political storytelling roots. But, you know, it, 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 it's only three episodes in and it's already like a meh TV show that, you know, has, you know, it doesn't even seem to have Jordan Peele's personal touch on it because Rod Serling actually wrote over 90 of the 150-some-odd uh, teleplays for the original Twilight Zone. And so far, we, we've only got three episodes of the revival under Jordan Peele, and he hasn't written a single one. And the third one is the only one that's even any good. So I don't know uh, how CBS expects people to go behind its paywall to watch STD when they... I mean, and, and it's pretty obvious that uh, STD is not getting the viewers at uh, CBS hopes because if it was, they wouldn't need to go bribing the stenographers at the New York Times to go ahead and write shill articles by people who've never actually even seen an actual Star Trek show or, or even one episode of a Star Trek show. All they've seen is STD and that's it. You know, they're just taking, you know, whatever talking points the, the suits are giving them and dutifully writing them down, and they're not even questioning anything. You know, and that's just a, a great big insult. So, uh, and let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, if you like what you've heard and you want to hear more, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to receive notifications whenever we upload new content. And if you want to help support the channel, head over to our Patreon or subscribe star page, become a donor, help us keep the lights on, and bring you more content. Until next time, this is Michael Wilk for the Wilk Report saying take care, good night, I'm out.